Between July 1st and July 12th, 1916, during an unusually hot summer, five people were attacked by sharks along the coast of New Jersey, and only one of the victims survived, creating a national hysteria so big that it would drastically change the way Americans viewed sharks. The first major attack occurred on Saturday, July 1st, in Beach Haven. Beach Haven is a resort town on Long Beach Island, off the southern coast of New Jersey. The victim, Charles Epting Van Sant, a man in his twenties of Philadelphia, was on vacation at the Angleside Hotel with his family. Before dinner, Charles decided to take a quick swim in the Atlantic with a dog. It is unclear if the dog actually belonged to Charles. Shortly after entering the water, Charles began shouting. Bathers believed he was calling to the dog, but in reality, a shark was biting the legs of Charles. He was rescued by a lifeguard, Alexander Ott, and a bystander, Sheridan Taylor. The rescuers claimed that the shark followed the bleeding Charles to shore as they pulled him from the water. At 6:45 p.m., Charles bled to death on the manager's desk of the Angleside Hotel. Witnesses of the Beach Haven fatality estimated that the shark was nine feet long. Despite this brutal attack and many sightings of large sharks swimming off the coast of New Jersey, beaches along the Jersey Shore remained open. Ocean swimming was still a relatively new form of entertainment in 1916, and many people were skeptical that sharks would even attack a human. The attack on Charles was minimized, and swimmers were encouraged to get back into the water. The second major attack occurred on Thursday, July 6, 1916, at the resort town of Spring Lake, New Jersey, only 45 miles north of Beach Haven, where the first attack had occurred. The victim was Charles Bruder, age 27, and since he happens to have the same first name as the last victim. I will refer to him by his last name, Bruder. Bruder worked as a bell captain at the Essex and Sussex Hotel. He was attacked while swimming 130 yards from shore. The shark bit him in the abdomen and severed his legs. Bruder's immense blood loss turned the water red. After hearing screams, a woman notified two lifeguards, saying, from her point of view. That a canoe with a red hole had capsized and was floating just at the water's surface, when in reality the red was actually Bruder's blood. Lifeguards Chris Anderson and George White rowed out to Bruder in a lifeboat and realized he had been bitten by a shark. They pulled him from the water, but unfortunately he bled to death on the way to shore. According to the New York Times, women were panic-stricken and fainted as Bruder's mutilated body was brought ashore. Guests and workers at the Essex and Sussex and neighboring hotels kindly raised money for Bruder's mother in Switzerland. The second attack was taken more seriously. By July 8th, armed guards and motorboats were patrolling much of the Jersey Shore. Many beaches were closed, and some towns constructed metal nets to keep people separated from the open ocean. The next two major attacks took place in Matawan Creek, near the town of Keyport, New Jersey, on Wednesday, July 12th. Located 30 miles north of Spring Lake, where the attack of Bruder had occurred, Matawan resembled a midwestern town rather than an Atlantic beach resort. Matawan's location made it an unlikely site for interactions between sharks and humans, seeing as it didn't even border the ocean. That's why when Thomas Cultural, a sea captain and Matawan resident, spotted an eight-foot-long shark in the creek, not the ocean, the town dismissed him. Around 2 p.m., a group of local boys, including 11-year-old Lester Stillwell, were playing in the creek together. One of the boys had brought along his pet dog, which was swimming with them as well. At an area called Wickoff Dock, they saw what appeared to be an old, weather-beaten board or log. But then a dorsal fin appeared in the water, and the boys realized it was a shark. 
Before Lester could climb from the creek, the shark pulled him underwater. The boys ran to town for help, and several men, including local businessman Watson Stanley Fisher, age 24, came to investigate. Watson and others dove into the creek to find Lester, believing he had to have suffered a seizure. After locating Lester's body and attempting to return to shore, Watson was also bitten by the shark in front of the other townspeople. This bite caused him to lose Lester in the water. Watson's right thigh was severely injured, and he unfortunately bled to death at Monmouth Memorial Hospital in Long Branch at 5.30 p.m. Lester's body was later recovered 150 feet upstream from the Wickoff Dock on July 14, 1916. The fifth and final victim, Joseph Dunn, age 14, of New York City, was also attacked on July 12th, only a half mile from the Wickoff Dock, and nearly 30 minutes after the fatal attacks on Lester and Watson. The shark bit his left leg, but luckily, Joseph was rescued by his brother and friend after a vicious tug-of-war battle with the shark. Joseph was taken to St. Peter's University Hospital in New Brunswick. He was able to recover from the bite and was released on September 15, 1916. As the national media shared stories of these attacks, a shark panic began. This panic was quoted to be unrivaled in American history, sweeping along the coasts of New York and New Jersey and spreading by telephone and telegraph, letter, and postcard. After the first attack at Beach Haven, scientists and the media only reluctantly blamed the death of Charles Van Sant on a shark. Some articles inferred that the shark must have been preying on the dog and must have attacked Charles by mistake. The media's response to the second attack was more sensational. Major American newspapers such as the Boston Herald, Chicago Sun-Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Post, and the San Francisco Chronicle placed the story on the front page. The growing panic cost New Jersey resort owners millions of dollars, in today's money, in lost tourism and sunbathing declined by 75% in some areas. On July 8, 1916, after the second attack, a press conference was held at the American Museum of Natural History, with three scientists as panelists. To calm the growing panic, the three men stressed that a third run-in with a shark was highly unlikely. Although, they were admittedly surprised that sharks bit anyone at all. However, one scientist did warn swimmers to stay close to shore and to take advantage of the netted bathing areas installed at public beaches. Local New Jersey governments made efforts to protect bathers, and the economy, from the so-called man-eating sharks. The 4th Avenue beach at Esbury Park was enclosed with a steel wire mesh fence and patrolled by armed motorboats. After the attacks on Lester, Watson, and Joseph, residents of Matawan lined Matawan Creek with nets and detonated dynamite in an attempt to catch and kill the shark. The Matawan mayor ordered the Matawan Journal to print wanted posters offering a $100 reward, which is around $2,700 today, to anyone who killed a shark in the creek. Despite the town's efforts, no sharks were captured or killed in Matawan Creek. Resort communities along the Jersey Shore petitioned the federal government to aid local efforts to protect beaches and hunt sharks. The House of Representatives appropriated $5,000, which is around $130,000 in today's money, for eradicating the New Jersey shark threat and President Woodrow Wilson scheduled a meeting with his cabinet to discuss the fatal attacks. Shark hunts ensued across the coasts of New Jersey and New York. Hundreds of sharks were captured on the East Coast as a result of the attacks. After the second incident, scientists and the public began presenting theories to explain which species of shark was responsible for the Jersey Shore attacks, or whether multiple sharks were involved. 
Although some people thought the attack could have been caused by an orca or a group of vicious giant sea turtles. Several fishermen claimed to have caught the Jersey man-eater in the days following the attacks. A blue shark was captured on July 14th near Long Ranch, and four days later, the same Thomas Cottrell, who had seen the shark in Matawan Creek, claimed to have captured a sandbar shark with a gill net near the mouth of the creek. Also on July 14th, a New York taxidermist and lion tamer by the name of Michael Slizer caught a seven and a half foot long, 325 pound shark only a few miles from the mouth of Matawan Creek. The shark nearly sank his rowboat before Michael killed it with his oar. Upon dissection, it was found that this young great white shark contained human remains in its stomach. No further attacks were reported along the Jersey Shore in the summer of 1916 after the capture of Michael Slizer's great white shark, and the shark was declared to be the Jersey man-eater. However, many people were skeptical of this assumption and proposed that the remains may have been from an already dead individual at sea, or perhaps the remains were not human at all. Some experts believe the culprit was not a great white shark at all, but a bull shark. Bull sharks can be aggressive and have the ability to travel both in the ocean and far up freshwater rivers and streams. Others believe that it must have been multiple sharks that conducted the attacks, since fishermen had been reporting hundreds of sharks swimming in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States that year. Nevertheless, the incidents forever changed how many people viewed sharks. Before 1916, American scholars doubted that sharks would fatally wound a living person in the temperate waters of the northeastern United States without provocation. At the time, academics were skeptical that a shark could even produce fatal wounds on human victims. Some asserted that a shark's jaws did not have the power to sever a human leg in a single bite. Not much was known about the movements or habits of sharks during the time. However, by the end of July 1916, many people were taking the capabilities of the great white shark more seriously, with many newspapers beginning to describe great whites as evil and saying that the man-eaters would not hesitate to attack humans when given the opportunity. Sharks, in general, started to be viewed by the public as fearless, ruthless killers. This reaction may have been inevitable. It has been stated that once a community encounters a number of incidents in a short period of time, the community reacts more or less the same. The usual order is fear, followed by denial, followed by revenge, and then followed by some rational or scientific approach to the problem. Because of the attacks, sharks were made a symbol of danger in American pop culture. In 1974, writer Peter Benchley published Jaws, a novel about a rogue great white shark that terrorizes the fictional Long Island coastal community of Amity. Although some sources say the author later denied that the Jersey Shore attacks were inspiration for the book, the novel was quickly adapted as the film Jaws by Steven Spielberg in 1975. Steven Spielberg's film makes reference to the events of 1916 and further inspires fear of the great white shark to the public. Although the exact shark or sharks that caused the Jersey Shore incidents will probably never be known, and what made the shark or sharks suddenly pursue humans will also probably never be known, the shark hatred the events have since spurred has certainly given the animals a bad rap. As scary as sharks may appear, scientists have observed that in most cases, Shark attacks are the result of the shark mistaking a human for their usual prey.